Hello everyone and welcome to part two of, Ig of Igneous, no, of Sedimentary Rocks. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, one last kind of rock, uh, an organic or biochemical rock, and then we're going to move on. We're going to talk about depositional environments. We're going to talk about sedimentary structures. I don't have a lot of slides, but I don't have a lot of content. So we'll see how long this goes for. If I need to throw a break in, I will. Obviously, you can all take a break whenever you want by hitting the pause button, and I encourage you to do that. So we talked about um, clastic sedimentary rocks or detrital sedimentary rocks, which are made out of sediment, as you would normally think of it. Then we talked about chemical sedimentary rocks that um, precipitate out of seawater. Um, and the third kind of sedimentary rock is an organic or biochemical sedimentary rock. And um, these form directly from biological materials. Now, there's a lot of wiggle room here because some people, there are some limestones that people like to call biochemical because, you know, if your limestone is made, for example, almost completely out of shell, um, there's a case to be made that that is made directly from biological material, uh, or there's a case to be made that that shell is nothing but calcium carbonate, and so people kind of go back and forth on that. Limestones are, by the way, kind of difficult to classify. Um, if you go on in geology and you end up working in limestones, uh, you're going to need to find out, okay, you know, which system do you guys use to classify your limestone? Limestones. They're not difficult. I said they're difficult. They're not difficult. It's just everyone kind of has their own system for classifying limestones. And so uh, they vary from place to place. So anyway, that being said, the main... Um, organic or biochemical sedimentary rock that we really deal with um, is coal. Uh, and because coal is formed in swamps usually uh, directly from plant remains, right? And so there are, so what happens is, let me show you this. Uh, let me go on to the next slide real quick. Uh, so this is a really good reconstruction of a uh, of about a 300-ish million year old coal swamp done by Bill DeMichael at the Smithsonian. And you can see all of this uh, plant material accumulating on the forest floor. Um, it's accumulating because the uh, the decomposer community, the insects and the other arthropods um, that would normally break down plant material had not yet evolved. And there's my master's and my PhD in two or three sentences. And so, yeah, so you get all this plant material accumulating on the floor of the forest Um and it accumulates and it becomes peat. Now, you know, we have peat today. You can go buy peat, you know, in, in uh, at the hardware store to put in your garden because it does make really good slow-release fertilizer, right? You mix all that all that partially decomposed plant material in uh, with your garden soil and it gradually releases nutrients as it decomposes because we have a robust decomposer community today where we didn't 300 million years ago. Um, you can burn peat to make electricity, but I wouldn't, um, it, it, it doesn't, you know, you don't get a whole lot more energy out of it than you put into it. Uh, there are places though where they do mostly because they don't have anything else to burn. Um, if you compact that peat a little bit, uh, dewater it, uh, burn off some impurities and whatnot, you make a very low grade coal called lignite. Um, I messed a lot with lignites in Texas. Uh, lignite is, is one step up from dirt. Uh, it, it really is. Um, you can burn lignite to make power. Don't. I mean, don't burn any of this stuff to make power. It releases all kinds of nasty chemicals into the air, not to mention the carbon dioxide. But, um, but just from a strictly economic point of view, you can burn lignite to make power, but you have to put your lignite-fired power plant pretty much at your lignite mine. Uh, you, you cannot ship it. <laughs> at, at that point, it's not worth it anymore. Um, but it's a very low-grade coal. You can still find all kinds of fossils in it, uh, and in that sense, it's really kind of interesting. Um, 
compact it some more and you make uh, the most common kind of coal bituminous coal this is usually what will burn um, uh, we burn a lot of this I uh, don't burn coal coal's bad there, there's no such thing as clean coal so don't don't burn coal but anyway um, uh, bituminous coal is a sedimentary rock and that forms from that that initial peat that's been compacted and dewatered and whatnot. And then if you uh, apply even more heat and pressure to it, you will turn this sedimentary rock into this metamorphic rock, uh, anthracite coal. This is the quote-unquote good stuff. Uh, you can mine this in Pennsylvania and ship it all over the country, and you're still ahead of the energy curve on it. So, so in that sense, it's very economic, but you still shouldn't be burning it because it still has a lot of gunk in it uh, that you don't want put don't want to be putting into the air um, environmentally coal is disastrous to mine it, it just yeah don't don't mine coal but anyway um the the compaction ratio by the way between peat and bituminous coal is about 10 to 1 so if you have 10 meters of peat uh, by the time you turn it into bituminous coal, uh, you've got about one meter of coal, uh, a one meter thick coal seam. Um, we don't make coal anymore. Coal is one of those interesting rocks that could not be made in the modern uh, world because we don't accumulate plant material on forest floors like this anymore. Um, I mean, consider once again to make one a one meter thick coal seam you need a 10 meter thick um um uh, bad, bad, sorry peat bed um or let, let's do it this way um you know a 10 meter thick coal seam is not out of the question at all um that's pretty you know i, would, I don't know how common it is but it's not out of the question if you're going to have a 10 meter thick coal bed that means you needed a hundred meters of peat to compact into that coal there is nowhere in the world today where there is a hundred meters of peat there's just not the decomposer community is way too active to let that much organic material build up so nice big thick hefty coal seams are a thing of the past uh, because they form in this environment and this environment that you see here simply doesn't exist anymore so in that sense it's kind of interesting and like i said that's what i did my masters and my phd on so i could talk a lot more about this but i'm not gonna so let's move on um the thing that geologists get from sedimentary rocks is environment of deposition different kinds of environments produce different sedimentary rocks and if you know how to read the rock you can tell what kind of environment was there millions of years ago when that rock formed and i'll show you this but for example you might be standing in Oh, I don't know Wyoming and looking at a rock that you know formed in a shallow marine environment 60 70 million years ago and you're in Wyoming right so clearly sea level used to be a bit higher right and so and maybe there's a rock on top of that that is something else and a rock below that that is something else so you can use these to kind of you know uh, work out environmental changes through time if you have enough rocks stacked up like let's say maybe someplace like the Grand Canyon right and we'll come back to this in just one second when rock is stacked vertically like that in the Grand Canyon we call that bedding uh, just those different layers of rock, right? But also keep in mind that, for example, if you're standing there in Wyoming in, you know, what 70 million years ago was a great inland sea called the Sundance Sea, but if you were to walk east, eventually you would walk out of what used to be that Sundance Sea and you might walk up onto the beach, that's a different environment of deposition, right? The sediments there are going to be different. Um, if you keep walking, you might walk into something else and something else and something else, right? So those lateral uh, changes in environment, those are called fa uh, facey or facies, plural, right? And so you could, you know, you go up and down through bedding and you go back and forth through facies. Uh, and I'll kind of show you what we, what we mean by that. In fact, let me show you now what we mean by that. So I've already seen this picture of the Grand Canyon. Um, 
all of these different kinds of rocks stacked on top of each other, right? And so here's a drawing of it that might make it a little more clear what's going on. These symbols mean things. That little brick thing is a limestone. The little dashes are shales. The the, the dots are sandstones, etc., etc. We have a whole array of symbols uh, that we use for rocks in these sorts of drawings and so a geologist can look at this and right away tell what's going on well you know so um so that um this rock right here is the red wall limestone right and so and so you know if you're standing at the grand canyon you went from a limestone to a shale to a sandstone to a different kind of sandstone etc shale etc all the way up to the kaibab limestone and find there's a volcano on the top and some in, in one particular place but anyway um so each of these changes in lithology rock type signifies a change in the environment at this particular place and we can trace uh we can trace the grand canyon back for a very long way um back all the way back to the cambrian although there are gaps here there are most definitely gaps here uh, the interesting thing about the grand canyon is that the youngest rock at the grand canyon is still older than the dinosaurs if you're going to the Grand Canyon to look for dinosaurs, you are a terrible paleontologist and you need to find another job. Uh, there are lots of fossils in the Grand Canyon. There are no dinosaurs out there. Uh, it, all the rock is too old for the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs don't come. The Kaibab is Permian. There's going to be a big extinction at the end of the Permian, and then the rock that contains the dinosaurs should be on top of here, but it's not there. It's been eroded away. So anyway, um, but but what what these different rock types signify once again is bedding, and this this is a change in environment through time, right? Now, what about facies? Well, let's look at a different picture. Now, don't uh, don't don't worry too much about these specific things um but you know if we just look at this environment and i'll show you a, another real one here in just a second but you know um you're going to get different rocks down here in these alluvial fans than you do in these salt lakes uh you're going to get different rocks in these swamps than you do in the rivers and in the estuaries and you know in the sh in the deltas and the shallow marine environment and the deeper marine environment etc all you know uh, you know, every location on this, or, or lots of the locations on this map, are going to produce different uh, sedimentary rocks, right? And that is that is really a lot of the point of studying sedimentary rocks, is to be able to work out, um, you know, ancient environments of deposition, or ancient environments, right? And so, uh, let, let's take a look at a few. I've got some pictures for us to take a look at. So, uh, what about like a shallow marine environment, like a reef or something like that? Well, these environments tend to make uh, a lot of limestone, and a lot of different kinds of limestone. And I put my picture of a pig here because there are islands in the or one island in particular um in the bahamas where you can go and swim uh with pigs um i hear they bite so i don't know if i would do that or not but anyway i don't know i just like that picture but um let me switch to google earth because this is actually one of my field areas down here um in the lower right and uh let me show it to you i've got it all set up here let me uh let me show it to you so so here it is and um uh and so this was a really fascinating place because what you've got here are two blocking reefs one here and one here uh stretching from one island to you know stretching between uh these two islands here uh and so we were very fortunate we were able to stage right here in this parking lot gave us access to this reef and that reef pretty easily but if we think about what's going on here so this is not land this is just very very shallow water this water is like a foot or two deep um but it's reef uh it's it's very difficult to walk across but it's breaking you know, waves are breaking against it uh because you know it might as well be dry ground waves are breaking against it and you get a, back here you get a lot of debris uh broken off 
uh, of that reef and you know this is what reefs do is they protect shorelines and so so you've got you know a sediment package back here that is really mostly broken off reef and in fact over here on this island this beachy bit here was not sand it was all broken reef parts and my photographs from this trip uh, got got lost on a computer hard drive so I'm not happy about that at all but anyway so this bit here now if I if I walk you know 50 feet across the island that's a sandy beach uh, and so that's a totally different kind of beach up here um, in front of the reef it's a very rocky beach uh, and so it was kind of, it's kind of interesting. Um, you know, you've got a pretty deep, pretty deep, not that deep, a relatively deep channel here, uh, making a different kind of sediment. You've got estuaries back here, mangrove estuaries, making a different kind of sediment. Uh, you got another channel here. Uh, you know, there's a, you know, from, let me see, um, let me zoom out a bit from tip here, no, from here to here is a little less than a mile. So within just less than a mile, you've got a lot of different facies, right? You've got a lot of different depositional environments producing a lot of different kinds of sediment. And that's kind of what we were studying was the, the, the fall off of the reef sediments as you go back. What role does this channel play, this channel, you know, all kinds of other things. The other thing to keep in mind, by the way, when you're thinking about environments of deposition um, is fossils right different organisms live in different places too right and so uh you know you're going to find different fossils back here on this protected beach than you are up here on the reef obviously you're going to get corals and all kinds of other things like that but back in here you're going to get different things right all kinds of different organisms living in different places and so when you find their fossils in the rock record that's another clue to the environment what kind of environment um what's going on here now if i raise sea level all this gets inundated and suddenly on top of my coral reef is a shallow marine sandstone or something like that right if i jack sea level up all of this goes away and gets you know covered over by you know something else and if sea level rises more it gets covered over by something else if sea level falls enough uh, this will turn into something else, right? This relies on the, these reefs rely on that water only being a foot or two deep. If it's if it's deeper, you're not going to get that. You're going to get something else there. And so, as environments change, sedimentary rocks change. Uh, environments can change laterally as you move around, um, or they can change temporally as sea level rises or falls or other changes to the environment happen. And so, yeah, so let's go back to our PowerPoint and I'll make it so um, y'all can see everything. Here we go. And there we go. Um, so, uh, th this lecture is kind of autobiographical, by the way. I have a lot of pictures and examples from stuff that I've done because this is this is the kind of work that I do. Um, here we are up in Canada, um, the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, also called the Canadian Badlands, and so this is a this is a shallow marine environment. Um, and so, you know, uh, 70 or so million years ago, when this rock was being laid down, there was this, you know, this ocean running up through, I'm sorry, this is 90 million years ago, it was also there 70, but anyway, there was this ocean running up through the center of North America, which is why, by the way, we find so many dinosaur fossils, right, along in here, uh, you know, because they're living, you know, this, this, this sea will expand and contract and expand and contract pretty pretty quickly really um and so you get a lot of dinosaurs living along this inland ocean and then a lot of things living in the inland ocean um and so you know very very rich and diverse fossil hunting up here um uh let's see um uh this this picture i was uh, right about there right about there <laughs> and so um and so this is you know this is what happens so i'm standing in you know alberta canada uh, and you know, looking at sediments that are, you know, shallow marine sands and muds and whatnot. Um, by the way, these sediments here are the marine sediments. See the green on top of it? That's glacial till. That is much, much younger. Only a few thousand years old, not tens of millions of years old. Sitting on top of there from the last glacial interval. Um, I believe I've said that if you're doing geology anywhere north, you know, anywhere up in here, uh, you have to account 
uh, for the presence of glaciers, uh, you know, uh, that ended about 10,000 years ago, uh, because they were definitely there. And so here, we're fortunate enough that erosion has cut down underneath the glacial till and exposed all of this uh, Cretaceous rock. And so there's, there's dinosaurs just sticking out of here. I mean, not literally, but there's a lot of dinosaurs in this rock, a lot of dinosaurs. If you're ever, um, up there in that area, uh, definitely visit the Royal Terrell Museum, which has an incredible dinosaur collection, uh, mostly pulled out of this rock. It's in the, the, the town of Drumheller, uh, and it's really, really amazing. Uh, meanwhile, back in the States, uh, you might have seen this. Um, this is a um, this is a rock formation called the Wave. Um, it is Jurassic um, in age, uh, which put which also puts it in the in the time of the dinosaurs. Obviously, Jurassic Park being what it is, but um, but this was a desert. And the fun thing about this, this is the Navajo sandstone. It is, um, it's in Arizona, um, and it's not near anything. If you want to go, you're going to hike, uh, and you've got to uh, get a permit to hike. Uh, they have a, uh, they have a lottery every day. You've got about a 50% chance of being picked, so allow a few days, <laughs> you know, in case you don't get picked the first day, you know. Um, but then they kind of make sure you have water and you're not an idiot, and then they send you out into the desert to hike to it. Um, it is it is beautiful. It is amazing. Uh, that tilting that you see is called cross bedding, um, and we'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, but this is a this back in the Jurassic. This was a desert. In modern times, it's a desert, right? That's just sheer dumb luck, though. It was a lot of things in between. But but definitely this is this is kind of fun because this is what a desert sandstone looks like, and it is currently in. A desert which like I said is just sheer dumb luck um, there are also um, a lot of uh, you know uh, sedimentary rocks that are made mostly of um, the remains of organisms right you, you get a lot of plankton a lot of little creepy crawlies living in that water these are diatoms or pieces of diatom um, um, you know uh, living in the water making a hard shell and that hard shell especially if it's silica uh, will form you know the rock chert and so uh, if you if, if your chert is is the right chert you can actually pull it out with a microscope and even see the um, even see the uh, uh, the little microorganisms in here. I want to uh, pause this and find you one picture. Uh, I will be right back. Okay, back. Um, I figured as long as I was grabbing some pictures, I would go ahead and grab one uh, from the Royal Terrell Museum in Drumheller. It really is a remarkable museum. Most, not all, but most of the fossils in that museum um, uh, came uh, from the Horseshoe Canyon Formation, which is right there around the museum. Um, it really is remarkable. If you ever get up that way, definitely check it out. Uh, here's what, here we go. One more picture. Oh, no, I did that. Okay, that's fine. Uh, one more picture of me here photobombing the, uh, the, the Triceratops. Okay, back. Sorry, had to edit. So anyway, there I am at the Royal Terrell Museum photobombing the Triceratops. So anyway, back to this, back to, you know, sedimentary rocks and uh, microscopic organisms just for kind of fun. These, this is the White Cliffs of Dover, near, oddly enough, Dover, England, uh, sitting right at the shortage, the shortest passage of, um, uh, across the English Channel from Europe to to mainland England, and so if you're going to invade England, uh, you really you know between the weather and the English Navy, you don't want to be in that uh, in that English Channel for very long at all. And this has been the case, you know, from the Vikings to the Germans in World War II. You just don't want to be out there. The problem is if you take the shortage shortest route, <laughs> I'll get it right across the English Channel, that's what you face, and that's not easy to get up. And so, you know, the White Cliffs of Dover have protected England from invasion, you know, for hundreds and hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, and so they, they are awfully sentimental about their White Cliffs. The reason I'm showing them to you, though, is they are made almost entirely of microscopic organisms called coccolithophores. And the rock itself is called a chalk. Uh, and chalk is made out of 
um, microorganisms that make a calcium carbonate skeleton like these coccolithophores. Um, uh, this rock is about 70 million years old. Um, and 70 million years ago, this area was a shallow ocean uh, full of these coccolithophores. And when, the, when they died, they settled to the bottom and made what today we see as the White Cliffs of Dover. Um, if we turn our attention a little bit to clastic sedimentary rocks, um, we see, you know, for example, a... Um, a conglomerate, right? A rock with pebble-sized particles that have been rounded over. Not surprisingly, conglomerates form in rivers, right? That's where you get that rounding over of the rock. This is the East Fork of the Cherry River uh, near Richwood, West Virginia. This is another of my field sites. I got a coal back up in here. Um, and uh, if I, I'm, I'm standing on a bridge, if I walk down into the the riverbed and point my camera down right it looks like that um and so you can see you know these rounded over pebble sized rocks um and you know if i turn this in, if i turn all of these individual rocks into a larger rock that rock would of course be a conglomerate um and so conglomerates form in rivers um here's a glacial outwash river um up in canada this is near Lake Louise. Uh, the water really is that color. It is just absolutely beautiful up there. But, <coughs> sorry, let me get some water. But once again, um, if I walk down into this riverbed and point my camera straight down, which I did, looks like that. Now, um, the interesting thing here is that the variety of rocks here is much larger than the variety of rocks up in uh up in west virginia um that's because you know glaciers bring in all kinds of rocks from all kinds of places and deposit them and so glaciers are a little bit tricky because you know the rock that's transported by the ice is very texturally immature uh it's kind of angular it's poorly sorted etc cetera, etc cetera. but there are you know rivers closely associated with these glacial environments and so you know when you're working with with glacial outwash plains and glacial areas if you're not actually dealing with the glacier a lot of times you've got you know a uh, river uh imprinted onto that onto those glacial sediments and so this can get pretty dang complicated now to be fair glacial outwash plains are notoriously complicated environments to un to, to 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 sort out because they are they are a combination of a lot of different things in a lot of different in a very very small area so so yeah um but you know this 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 is uh this is kind of fun because you know here's here's a conglomerate um you can see a pebble sticking out of it there and a pebble sticking out of it there and pebbles sticking out here and here. And yeah, that, that's a pretty classic conglomerate. My guess is a lot of these pebbles here weathered out of that conglomerate. And so, yeah, it's a conglomerate and conglomerates form in rivers. Uh, the trick here is that this particular conglomerate is on Mars. Um, and so, yeah, um, you don't change the rules just because you're on Mars, right? Uh, conglomerates form in rivers. That is the environment that, you know, rounds over those pebbles and makes, makes them look like that. The thing that does that is water. Uh, and so this is, you know, one of now many, many lines of evidence that there used to be, you know, water on Mars, standing, running water on Mars. And we figure that out for Mars the same way you figure it out for the Earth, right? You do environments of deposition on Mars the same way, right? You look for, you know, what kind of rocks are forming, where do those rocks form in modern environments? What kind of minerals am I getting? You know, what what kind of uh, sedimentary structures, which we'll talk about here in a few minutes, am I getting? It's all kinds of stuff like that. And, you know, you can do it on Mars, too. You just need a robot to roll around and collect your data. Uh, but but you can absolutely do this uh, do this kind of work on Mars as well. This is a breccia, right? This is like a conglomerate, only the particles are angular. Um, breccias form in, it's a, it's a fairly texturally immature sediment, right? So it can form pretty near 
the source site for the sediment. Uh, you know, you're not going to get breaches forming down, down late in rivers or something like that. One place you get breaches though, which is kind of fun, uh, is impact sites, right? This is, uh, this is Behringer Crater out in Arizona. Um, <clears throat> a really nice visible crater on the earth we don't have a whole lot of visible craters it's not that the earth doesn't get hit it's that craters get filled in or washed away or scraped over by glaciers or something like that and so uh but we have you know but impact breaches are very common around these craters and as you might imagine impact breaches are very common on the moon right we brought back a lot of impact breaches from the moon where something really big smacks into the into the planet or the moon makes all these jagged fragments as stuff flies out of that crater and then um and then that is cemented together to make a breccia uh and so another uh, another environment for these breccias is glaciers now but remember glaciers are complicated because there's rivers right this is the Athabasca glacier and the columbia ice fields from my trip up to canada a few years ago um i got another picture of me photobombing the glacier that i will not show you but anyway um right in front of this you can't see it in this picture right in front of this is a river a stream okay so so from this melting ice right and so um so you know, glaciers are really really tricky um they bring in rocks from all over and they just drop them uh that's why you know so many new england um new england farm fields have stone walls around them it's not that the farmers particularly like making stone walls but you know thousands of years ago the gla years ago the glaciers dropped those rocks and they had to have somewhere to put them and so they made all these stone walls you go to new england there's stone walls all over new england because the first step to farming in new england is to get the rocks out of your field uh because glaciers drop they pick up all kinds of rocks they carry them around and they drop them right uh this is a this is a picture i took of this glacial outwash plane and you can see how you can't really see it here i've got better pictures but i won't go get them but you can see how how much variety there is in the kind of rock there's a lot of different kinds of rock here because that glacier is carrying them uh from all kinds of different places you can see how texturally immature they are uh they're kind of kind of angular but also don't forget you're gonna have a lot of running water around here to round them over so so glaciers tend to make less mature sediments but they're very diverse there's a lot of different kinds of rock in glacial sediments because because um, they're carrying that rock from all kinds of all kinds of different places, especially big continental glaciers. Right? This is this is what we would call an alpine glacier. It's really only you know drawing from you know these rocks here. A big continental glacier covering all of Canada and you know the upper third of the United States is going to bring rock from you know all over the place. Uh, and so. And if you're working in the Midwestern New England, you've got to understand that you're dealing with that. Um, and so, yeah, now silts, um, silts make uh, silt stone, oddly enough. And the big environment for this is um, uh, lakes. Right, here's some siltstone in England, and you can see that it's been tilted. Uh, it's not originally deposited like that, but here's another one of those glacial lakes from Canada. Um, and, you know, that water, I did not Photoshop this. I did not do anything to this. That's just what color that water is. Uh, it is absolutely beautiful. Uh, but the rock that's being deposited, even as we speak, on the bottom of this lake is most likely silt which will be turned into silt stone. Um, and so if we, look, if we look at what that looks like, uh, frequently it looks like this. Uh, you get these very, very fine sediments alternating between dark and light and dark and light. These are called varves. Um, and uh, they are really fascinating because one set of dark and light represents one year. It is very, very seldom that you can look at a sediment and say this was deposited in this much time. In fact, I think this might be the only case where you can do this. Um, and so, you know, this is once again one of the only times you can look at this sediment and go, yep, that's a year right there. Okay. But here's what happens in the spring and the summer, most of the sediment washing into the lake is clastic in nature right uh, as opposed to organic you don't have a lot of plant parts washing in okay and so you make a light colored layer 
in the fall and winter you have a lot of plant material washing in these trees will change will drop their leaves now this is not happening in lake okeechobee right now right we're talking about lakes that are you know temperate to north temperate right we're, we're not talking about lakes in the south or the american southwest or something like that right so think you know new england europe for this kind of thing and so in the fall and the winter um you drop you deposit that darker layer right because those trees drop their leaves those leaves wash into the lake and so you get this more organic rich layer and so that's one year one pair of light and dark is one year now a good archaeologist can tell you what year that is archaeologists love their vars oh my gosh they love their vars so much uh because if you find an artifact in one of these varves um you know uh you know how old the artifact is right and so you can trace all kinds of things i had a friend who traced viking trade routes across europe um you know from from you know finds of viking artifacts in varves uh and so you can trace the spread of people you can trace the development of technology you know you can trace all kinds of things by using these vars and knowing what year that is right if you find for example um if you find you know you know a sword <laughs> in a, you know in a in a in an ancient lake or in a varve deposit you know, you know uh well those people were first of all making swords in that area or those people were there it tells you all kinds of things and so it's uh you know really quite interesting and so um if if archaeologists love their varves by the way paleontologists we love our shales um, you know, these are these fine grained rocks. They tend to form in deeper water environments or in quiet water environments. And they are quite frequently just full of fossils. Um, you show a paleontologist a shale and we are going to sit down on our butts and we are going to split that shale and look for stuff. You might find plant fossils. Here's a trilobite that looks like Olinellus to me, which would make that rock basal cambrian. Um, but we we love we love our shales uh once again from my trip to canada this is the uh the Bur this is mount burgess uh home to the burgess shale um which is an amazing shale you hike up there and it looks like that um uh, just 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 you know this this is the shale here um unfortunately there's not a lot of fossils left there um when this was first discovered scientists from the smithsonian institution basically brought dump trucks in and re and um removed just about all of the burgess shale or at least the parts that had fossils in them um which canada was like away doesn't that belong to us what are you doing taking our shale and so now they have very very strict laws about fossil collecting in canada and rightfully so um i've seen more burgess shale fossils at the smithsonian than i have at the burgess shale um, um which is a you know a whole you know scientific imperialism thing that we could talk about but let's not go there but if we look at some of these fossils they're really strange they are really really strange this this shale is about 550 million years old this was a time when the environment was really open to all kinds of weird um evolutionary innovations things had you know round mouth parts this is something called anim amalarina caris here's a bigger one here's a whole one here with round mouth parts and I don't even know what you call those things sticking off of its head. Uh, this thing here is called Opabinia. There's a there's an Opabinia fossil there. Once again, um, arm cutter clipper thingers sticking out of its head. Um, there were also things like trilobites that we're much more familiar with. Uh, and then this thing is fun. Uh, this is called Hallucigenia. Um, and, uh, and we don't know what hallucinogenia is. It's just kind of hallucinogenia. Um, in fact, when they first discovered it, they reconstructed it upside down. They put the spikes on the bottom and these little tubey thingers, uh, up on its back. And then someone said, okay, things don't walk on spikes, right? That, that doesn't really 
actually makes sense okay so so they're oh yeah you're probably right so the spikes are up for protection but you know but we don't th this could also be a small part of a much larger animal this is not that big this is a fossil that's at the smithsonian it is literally about two inches across something like that it is not very big and could really be you know they call this the quote unquote head but that yeah i mean it could be anything so here's a little reconstruction of it down there that you can barely see but you know we don't know what that is it's just it's hallucinogenia right people say well what's that i don't know it's hallucinogenia so so yeah so so um but anyway, uh, you know, but once again, fossils are very, very useful for reconstructing ancient environments. Not these so much because we don't know what the heck they are, uh, but, but well, trilobites we do. But, um, but, but they can be very useful in reconstructing ancient environments. So I'm about to show you a wall of words for which I apologize. Um, but this gets into something called sedimentary structures. Um, and so... I promise not, well, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, and I'll show you some pictures. Um, I, I kind of want all this on one page in your notes so that you had it all kind of in one place. Um, so if you want if you want to work out um, environment of deposition, the bulk properties of the sediment are very useful, right? Rounding, sorting, sphericity, you know, mature versus immature sediments and things like that are very, very useful and can definitely get you a long way toward reconstructing an ancient environment, but they won't get you all the way. Sorry, I needed a drink. Um, they won't get you all the way. Um, I am looking down right now and I am 40 minutes into this uh, lecture. Um, I am not going to insert a, a break here, but um, but consider taking one <laughs> and then uh, come back and we'll do sedimentary structures. Um, it's just there's just not that much more to go, I don't think. So yeah, so um, so take a break here. We're gonna pause. Doo, doo, doo. Okay, now you're back. Okay, so uh, sedimentary structures. So so these are patterns, if you will, in the rock um, that can tell us about environment of deposition. There are two kinds, primary and secondary. Primary structures um, um, are formed during the deposition of the rock, and then secondary structures are formed after, and I should say deposition of the sediment, not deposition of the rock. Okay, and so I'm going to go through, I'm not going to sit here and read this to you. I'm going to go through and uh, and show you pictures, and then you have this, uh, you know, if you want to print it out and follow along as I go, but I would really much rather show you pictures of things than I would um, this text. So, so let's take a look. Okay, so the most basic primary structure is bedding. Right, uh, this is the Grand Canyon, at least the upper part of the Grand Canyon, and you can see, you know, these different kinds of rock all laying on top of each other. That's bedding, okay, um, and so that is the most the most fundamental kind of sedimentary structure, and it just signifies. You know, this isn't going to tell you an environment, but it is going to tell you a change in environment, right? As I, you know, as I go from here to here to here to here to here to the Kaibab limestone on top, the envir the rock is changing because through time the environment was changing. Simple enough, I think. We've kind of already talked about that. Along with bedding, though, there is cross bedding. And we're back to uh, the um, the uh, the desert, the Jurassic Desert sandstone, the Navajo sandstone, and you can see how this rock is deposited at an angle, right? That's the cross bedding. Uh, we'll learn later on when we talk about um, geologic time that rock is originally deposited mostly flat unless there's a current or something like that. In this case, it was wind, right? And this is the kind of uh, cross bedding that we get uh, from the wind what we call we call it trough cross bedding where where it um, you know it, it well it's a trough <laughs> okay now the, the 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 interesting thing about cross bedding or the the fun thing about cross bedding is that it can tell you stratigraphic up right and in this case you know the up that we see here is the up according to the rock but through tectonic deformation rock can be flipped over all the time if you go up into the appalachians or somewhere like that or somewhere where there's been a lot of mountain building it is entirely possible that that rock has been deformed and turned over 
Okay, so now what you're looking at is, as up is actually down as far as the rock is concerned, or maybe more importantly, as far as like the sequence of events is concerned. Cross bedding can help you with this, okay? Because do you see how that, see how this cross bed comes up and ends right there, how it's truncated right there? When cross beds form, they are truncated on top. Okay, uh, and I'm going to pause this and bring up a blank slide so I can show you how this works. I will be right back. Okay, I've got my Microsoft whiteboard here because PowerPoint was not uh, doing what I wanted it to do. And so what we want to do is let's think about how these cross beds are going to form. Okay, so, so if you've got a current running this way, my lousy arrow, uh, what's going to happen is as the sediment is deposited, um, it's deposited kind of like this. Uh, where you have something called a top set bed up here, a four set bed down here, and a bottom set bed down here. And you'll get a whole series of these that look kind of like this. And so, um, and so let me draw one more. And so what you can see here is that at the bottom, and this is not, a, I'm not very good at this, but at the bottom, you can see how these are, are approaching the bottom kind of at a curve. Now, here's the trick. As this goes on, um, what's going to happen is subsequent erosion is going to remove uh, these top set beds. And so they'll end up kind of looking like this. And I'm going to delete my arrow while I'm at it just because it's in my way. Um, and so what happens then is the next set of cross beds will get, and I'll just draw the four set bed and then the bottom set bed along here, right? And so the next set of cross beds gets deposited like this on top of the previous set. And so once again, excuse my terrible drawing, but what you see here is that at the top of the cross bed, it hits at an angle and gets truncated. At the bottom of the cross bed, it just curves down onto a surface, okay? And that's what cross beds look like, okay? And so let me go, let me get rid of my pen and go back to my PowerPoint and I'll show you uh, what they look like um, in the real world here. And so I'm going to do that and I'm going to do this and we're going to do this so you can see everything and bingo. Okay, so here's some cross beds and if you look carefully, you can see how if I look at, you know, this, this uh, cr one cross bed right here, okay, you can see how at the top, it's truncated, it stops, right? And then at the bottom, it just kind of curves down onto that rock underneath it. And that bottom set bed there is truncating the top of the next set down, right? And so you can see that, you know, this goes up and is cut off by that bed on top of it and then it goes down at a you know at a curve and then it cuts off the bed below it right that cut off should always be on top okay that curve down to the bed below it should always be on the bottom and so you know a geologist looking at this is going to go yep that is it has not been flipped over by tectonic forces or anything like that. What I'm seeing here as up is also up as far as the rock is concerned, right? If a geologist comes on this, now I know the words are upside down, but I just flipped the picture upside down, right? Oh no, right? The top, the cross beds are truncated on the, you can you no, know, they're truncated on the bottom. They're curving at the top, no, right? You know, even without the words, a geologist would look at this and go, that section has been flipped over. Right. Tectonically, it was deformed. It was caught up in a mountain building event. Something flipped it over. Um, and this is something that we always, always, always have to keep in mind when we're working in the field. As you walk up to a big sandstone or something, find some cross beds. Find some cross beds. Right? The other thing this gives us, by the way, if I look at it right side up, because it gives me a headache to look at it upside down, the current here is running left to right. Right, the cross bed, if the cross bed is doing this, the kind of quote unquote down slope of the cross bed, the current is running this way, right? If I imagine putting a little marble on the cross bed, if I could roll a marble down one bed, that marble's moving in the direction the current is moving. So cross beds are really handy. We get two things. We get stratigraphic quote unquote up, 
right? What direction does the rock think is up versus what direction actually is up, okay? And then we also get the direction of the current, either the wind current if it's a desert or the water current if it's a river. And so cross beds are really quite helpful things. Uh, they really and truly are. And that one's upside down. Um, another thing that's really kind of handy is um, graded bedding. Graded bedding is bedding that um, goes from coarse to fine um, as you go up. And so as we look at this picture over here on the left, this is one graded bed and then there begins another graded bed. And so you can see you have coarser pebble sized particles down here and then it gets finer and finer and finer as it goes up and then you get another layer of coarser pebble sized particles beginning another graded bed and so these form in underwater deposits um called deep sea fans uh, from these uh, things called turbidity currents. And a turbidity current, you can see here, uh, downslope, downslope movement of dense sedimentation water. Um, you know, it's one way to think of it is is kind of like an underwater landslide. They're a little bit more complicated than that, but basically that's what they are. Basically, and so you get these turbidity currents running down off of the. Uh, off the continental shelf and the continental slope and then as they reach the um what we call the abyssal plain this this deeper water out here where the the bottom is flat they slow down and as they slow down the first thing they deposit is uh pebble sized particles and then they slow down more and they deposit coarse sand medium sand finer sand and then maybe even some silt before the next turbidity current comes along and deposits pebbles that will then grade up into you know finer sand and then the next turbidity current comes along and these things will pile up on each other uh look like that um Closer up, they look like this, right? Where you've got, uh, you know, pebble-sized particles down here fining upward. And um, a geologist named Balma was one of the first people to recognize what this was. And this whole, this whole thing, this packet of sediment with this graded bedding is called a Balma sequence. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I met Dr. Balma at a meeting one time. And I was like, hey, I know your sequence. That's pretty cool. So everyone knows the sequence because it's a very famous thing. Um, this will also, by the way, give you stratigraphic up right the coarser rocks on the bottom the finer rocks on the top if the coarser rock is on the top that 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 thing's been flipped over and so you need to you need to account for that so so um uh, this is not nearly as common as is cross bedding but it is still also very very useful um you know when you think about depositional environments um you know there the, um you know or 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 rather let's say um sedimentary structures you know it's important to realize that what happens in the modern world is frequently uh you know incorporated into the rock record and so um you know these are we're about to get into now what we call secondary structures right so the sediment is deposited and then something happens to it right and we've all been to the beach you've all seen ripple marks at the beach that's nothing new well what about what what about you know what about this right where those ripple marks were incorporated into the rock uh you yeah, know right this this can be you know this this can be valuable ripple marks form in an environment you know near shore usually kind of environment uh depending on the rock and so you know you know you know what you're dealing with here uh when we think about ripple marks there are both symmetrical and asymmetrical ripple marks right if you're in an area where the water is only moving in one direction you'll get ripple marks that look like this they're asymmetrical they're steeper on one side and shallower on the other side right these are steeper on this side and shallower on that side that tells me that that water was flowing this way across that across that sediment to make that ripple mark to make that rock if the water though is kind of moving back and forth kind of like in a wave or you know little little, little near shore back and forth water action you make symmetrical ripple marks that look like this right they're just kind of rounded humps neither side is steeper or shallower uh and so you know once again the water here is just kind of moving back and forth right and this is how we read the rock right this is how geologists go into the field and figure out 
what is going on okay um you know silly things uh you'll find geologists a lot of times staring at mud cracks <laughs> right? yes mud cracks right it's mud when it dries out it cracks and the edges turn up right mud cracks You've all seen them. You'll walk right past them. You don't give them another thought. Geologists will absolutely stop and stare at mud cracks uh, because they're really kind of cool. And they absolutely do get incorporated into the fossil record. There's there's some mud cracks, right? Uh, now, the fun thing about mud cracks is, once again, the edges turn up up right we're always worried about stratigraphic up or something like that and mud cracks can definitely help out with that if you look at them from the side you know are they turned up or are they turned down if they're turned down then your rock has been flipped over and so you know uh you know and this tells us you know there was a muddy environment that it was dry it dried out etc etc went a long time without rain and this happened and so there's a lot that you can infer um from mud cracks um, in the rock record. Speaking of rain, this one's just kind of fun, y'all. Uh, these are raindrop impressions. I know it looks like the moon, right? I could zoom in on this and tell you that was the moon, and y'all would go, "Oh, look, there's craters." You know, <laughs> yeah, no. uh, those are tiny little craters uh, made by raindrops, which I don't really. I mean, uh, yeah, you can once again you can get stratigraphic up from them and whatever. Yeah, I, I don't know how really terribly useful they are. But they're fun. <laughs> they're really, really very cool. Um, another thing that happens is as um, as um, sticks and debris is scraped along a river bottom, it will make things called flute casts. And so what you're looking at here, you're actually looking up at the bottom of the river. So imagine that a stick poked the bottom of the river made a hole that was then kind of elongated by that current okay and then uh more sediment was deposited uh and then you pop it off and you look up at um at that sediment that was deposited later later and that's what you see so what's sticking out here was a hole in the bottom of the original river so you are effectively looking up at a riverbed here and even if you don't really know, you can get a sense that the current is going this way, right? The current is flowing from upper right to lower left, right? Because as stuff is dragged along, um, as things are dragged along, uh, you know, you get these linear features on the river bottom that are preserved in sediment. You get these, these holes that get gouged out and then elongated, once again, preserved in sediment. And so uh, when you find these, these are really handy because they tell you, one, there was a river, and they tell you what direction the river was flowing. Good stuff, okay? Um, I also just want to mention something um, near and dear to my heart. Um, as a as a paleontologist, and that is bioturbation, right? Which is also a secondary sedimentary structure because it happens after the sediment is deposited. But you know, a lot of times you have little things burrowing through the sediment. This is a burrow here. This is a burrow here. There's another burrow, right? Um, you know, and altering the sediment. Uh, now, you know, this is important because different organisms live in different places, and so. Um, and so this can be very, very helpful with, uh, with environment of deposition. In fact, um, if you study paleontology, one of the, maybe the first day of paleontology, you learn that there's two kinds of fossils. There's body fossils and trace fossils. Uh, body fossils are the remains of the organism. Trace fossils are the remains of the activities of the organism. There are a lot more trace fossils than there are body fossils. Um, and so, uh, you know, every organism can leave behind one complete body fossil okay if arthropods are molting we could you know make an exception for that but you know what i mean um but they could literally leave behind thousands of trace fossils through their life and so um and so here we have things burrowing in the sediment that tells us there were things there people who know more can tell you how deep the water was all kinds of things all kinds of things we can learn from these trace fossils uh and you know maybe one of the most um most you know distinctive trace fossils is of course footprints in this case a dinosaur footprint um 
from the Glen Rose formation. Uh, and so, and you know, sometimes you don't just have one, sometimes you have a whole bunch of them. Uh, and you know, uh, you can do all kinds of stuff with these, but this tells you it was dry ground and blah, blah, blah. You can also calculate, by the way, how fast the, the, uh, the, the dinosaur was moving uh, by measuring the distance between the footprints and the, um, and the size of the footprints and then plugging into some fancy math. So, um, and so anyway, so th this in the context of sediments, this is a, these are considered secondary sedimentary structures and they're called, and it's called once again, bioturbation, uh, disturbing the sediment by biological organisms, right? And so, uh, paleontologists love them. Sedimentologists, eh, not so much. This is mostly a paleontology thing, but it gets stuck in with the sedimentology stuff. Okay. There's the end of sediments. Yay for sediments. Okay. I'll go and get this uploaded. Uh, and I'll see you guys next for Metamorphic Rocks. All right, take care.